Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag? To say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! You know, some owner's going to do that. He's going to say, that guy that disrespects our flag, he's fired. And that owner, they don't know it. They don't know it. They're friends of mine, many of them. They don't know it. They'll be the most popular person for a week. They'll be the most popular person in this country, because that's a total disrespect of our heritage. That's a total disrespect of everything that we stand for, OK? everything that we stand for. And I know we have freedoms, and we have freedom of choice, and many, many different freedoms. But you know what? It's still totally disrespectful. What is good, my people? We are live back again with another episode of The Forecast. Now, I'm sure a lot of people remember the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore, which caused a lot of riots in the city. Well, recently, the Department of Justice decided not to press charges on the police officers. And I don't know what's going on there because they're pressing charges, then they're getting acquitted, now they're not pressing charges. I don't know. But let's actually go back and see what happens to Freddie Gray for ourselves. Right. Ah. Right. His leg looks broke. Look at his leg. Look at his leg. That boy leg look broke. Oh his leg broken. Y'all dragging him like that. Don't worry, shorty. We, we recording this shit. We recording it. Shorty, that was after they tased the fuck out of him like that. Man, I've been recording this shit. I've been recording it. I've been recording it. What car they come out of, yo? He on a bike, yo, right there. Him right there. He on a bike. I got it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, yo. After they did tased yo like that, you wonder why he can't use his legs. Yeah, I sure will. I sure will. I sure the fuck will. But that ain't gonna stop me from using this phone.
Now, you can obviously see that these police officers injured him when they were trying to arrest him. It looked like he already suffered this spinal cord injury. It looked like he couldn't even move his legs. It looked like he was paralyzed. But of course, there's always something a nigga did wrong. So let's see what this brother did wrong to deserve this. Two and a half years after this video showing the arrest of Freddie Gray outraged Baltimore, exposed the fractured trust between citizens and police, and set off a series of events that scarred the city forever, the Department of Justice investigation ends finding, quote, insufficient evidence to support federal criminal civil rights charges against six Baltimore police officers. The DOJ report starts by outlining legal failures by the city state's attorney's office to convict those officers under Maryland law, then breaks down each fact in the case and why the DOJ determined there was not clear proof each officer acted with intent to violate federal laws. Among the findings, a lack of evidence Officer Caesar Goodson intentionally gave Gray a rough ride in the back of a police van, despite largely concluding Gray suffered his fatal injuries when his head forcefully impacted interior surfaces of the wagon. In a statement, the FOP writes, At no time did we ever believe there was enough evidence that any of the officers violated anyone's civil rights or were guilty of violating any federal laws. The findings of our comprehensive thorough and independent investigation. The FOP also took another shot at City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby, stating they wish she would have taken more time to conduct a thorough investigation before pursuing charges. Mosby's office responded to the DOJ findings with a reminder of the recently completed internal investigation conducted by outside police agencies, stating, quote, those in the legal community know that federal civil rights violations require a different burden of proof than criminal violations of law. An independent investigation determined that policing protocols were violated by these officers and contributed to the mishandling of Freddie Gray's in-custody death. And disciplinary hearings as the result of that internal investigation are now scheduled for the end of October. At least three of the officers could face termination. So... What they're trying to tell us is that the DOJ, who did an investigation on the Baltimore Police Department and found corruption, they found racist bias. But this report says that the Baltimore Police Department systematically exercised unconstitutional actions toward the people of Baltimore, violating federal law, especially toward the African-American community, saying, quote, making unconstitutional stop arrests at searches discrimination against African Americans, using excessive force, retaliating against free speech. They also go on to say that when police officers were trained, they were trained with inaccurate law, unconstitutional law, many times, quote, driven by systemic deficiencies in Baltimore Police Department's policies, training, supervision, and accountability structures that fail to equip officers with the with the tools they need to protect and police effectively and within the bounds of federal law. Pedestrian stops per 1,000 residents, 2010 to 2015. You see how many more African Americans were stopped rather than the white population. They say there are two Baltimores, the white Baltimore and the African American Baltimore, and that African Americans are targeted on stops, searches, and arrests. Quote, 10 people stopped at least 10 times or more of those 410 people 95 percent were african-american one african-american man stopped 30 times he was never criminally charged and carol that was for loitering or trespassing look at this particular case and say well we don't see any reason why perhaps this person's civil rights could have been violated and here we have another black woman who is state attorney in the city of Baltimore, who is getting attacked for standing up for our people. And again, like I always say, these are the kind of people who we need to have back, especially other black lawyers and black judges, but us as the whole community need to be having these people back. So even though we have video evidence of what happened, even though the DOJ found evidence for racism in the police departments in Baltimore, it's just not in this particular case.
even though in this particular case, the DOJ found multiple instances where the cops were wrong, where the cops did the wrong thing. We just continue to gloss over all the wrong things the cops do, all the infractions that the cops have, because they're no big deal. But they lead to people getting killed. And they're just telling us to our face, even though these cops who are supposed to be the people who uphold the law, break rules, we're not really going to punish them for that. We're not going to do anything for that. We can admit that they broke laws or they broke rules and there will be no legal action whatsoever, even if you wind up dead. The most that happens is that maybe this particular police department will fire them. And then they'll move a couple of states over or maybe even a couple counties over and get hired by another police department. And we have to realize how real it is right now. When they tell you they feel like these are justified murders, they feel like these are justified murders. They're not just saying that to troll you. They feel that way for real. And at the end of the day, in America, nothing is going to help you but yourself. DNA won't help you. Video evidence won't help you. We've been getting video evidence since the 90s, since Rodney King. And it hasn't helped one bit since. Marching in the streets ain't going to help you. I honor what our ancestors did, but it's 50 years later and we're still talking about police brutality. It's been hundreds of years and we are still begging and pleading for them not to kill us. And when you say that, they call you racist. Because what they hear by you saying, please don't kill us, is you saying kill all whites. That's what they're hearing. Now, until we realize that whatever our beliefs are, it really doesn't matter. Until we put them to the side and come together and actually just start protecting ourselves... Because we have no choice. We never really had a choice. And our ancestors had a lot more togetherness. There was more of a family structure. They were able to build an economy when they had the chance. Because they had to rely on each other. My grandmother was born in 1921. My grandmother was born in 1921 in Emporia, Virginia. And she was only really able to go to school until the fifth grade because it was very, very hard to go to school back then. But she was still able to create a stable home and a stable family and was able to go out and work and earn money because black people had to stick together. They had to hire other black people. They had to go shop at other black places. They had no other choice. But she used to tell me stories about how every day she would come home from school and some white boys would chase her. Now, you know, when I was young hearing the story, I'm thinking, oh, it's just some boys chasing some girls. It's just harmless. But when you get older and realize that this was the 1920s and the 1930s in Emporia, Virginia, these white boys was chasing her for her life. It's 2017. What I look like telling my grandkids when I'm an old man that, oh, every time I get pulled over, I had to worry about some cop killing me or teaching him about driving while black or walking while black or interacting with the police at all. It's our generation's responsibility to take the next steps for which our ancestors have laid out for us. To put the next generation in a position to empower themselves. And we see the same thing over and over and over. And we still asking and hoping and surprised when we don't get justice. Of course not. America was not built on justice for black people. It was literally built off torture and exploitation of black people. What do you think is going to change we have to come together to build our own shit and be able to protect ourselves. You know, we're still praying for justice for one or two of our brothers. We shouldn't be taking no losses. We shouldn't be letting our people get killed in the first place. We have to start protecting ourselves. 
protecting our children and we have to put our differences to the side or the same thing is going to happen over and over and over for another hundred years. The police commissioner today called their investigation massive, saying more than 30 investigators are looking into Freddie Gray's death. And he also said that Freddie Gray should have had medical attention at the very spot that he was arrested. We have live team coverage tonight, including more on the national rally planned for tomorrow. But we begin with 11 News reporter George Lettuce, who's live at City Police Headquarters downtown. George. Well, Donna and Stan, about two hours ago, city police released about a dozen video clips from what the city's camera surveillance system picked up the morning Freddie Gray was arrested and then injured. That, along with a press conference from police today, is giving us a better vantage point of this timeline. At 8.39 a.m. April 12th, a city street camera shows a man running, and then two officers get on their bikes to go after him. By 842, the wagon shows up and police put Freddie Gray in, which brings us to mistake number one admitted by Police Commissioner Anthony Batts Friday afternoon. We know our police employees failed to get him medical attention in a timely manner multiple times. Shortly before Freddie Gray is put in the wagon the first time, he requested an inhaler. And quite frankly, that's exactly where Freddie Gray should have received medical attention, and he did not. Mistake number two. We know he was not buckled in the transportation wagon, as he should have been. No excuses for that, period. His hands were cuffed at the first stop. Leg irons were put on him at the second stop, leaving a hogtied gray in the wagon without a seatbelt. Here's street camera footage of the wagon leaving the second stop at 854. The wagon then makes stop number three at Druid Hill Avenue and Dolphin Street, where police indicate gray was responsive. There's no city camera footage of this stop. The transport wagon stops again for a second time at Druid Hill and Dolphin to deal with Mr. Gray, and the facts of that interaction are under investigation. We have another officer that comes up to witness uh, Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray is talking there. They pick him up uh, off the floor and place him on the seat at that time. He says he needs a, pair, he needs a, a medic. But a medic was never called. There is a... There's and I'm not going to give you all our information. There's an there's a incident, or not an incident, because no, I'll get you off on the right path. There's something that we have to look at that we have to have further investigation on. The wagon stops a fourth time to pick up another suspect at Pennsylvania and North Avenues. The paramedics are then called once the wagon arrives at the Western District. The call was made at 9.26 a.m. Gray was unresponsive at that point. But according to new information from the 11 News I team, the medic call was mistakenly for a broken arm. The medic unit arrived at the Western District at 9.33 without the fire engine and extra manpower usually dispatched with a more serious call. After backup arrived, Gray was on his way to shock trauma at 9.54 with a pulse, sources say. He died a week later. A scathing new report out tonight from the Justice Department says police in Baltimore have lost the trust of the community and they say it's because of a history of racial discrimination and how the law is enforced. The city is now responding and our justice correspondent Pete Williams has details. Launched in the aftermath of community outrage over Freddie Gray's death in police custody, the civil rights investigation found that officers in the Baltimore Police Department, BPD, routinely stop, search, and arrest African-American residents for no good reason. These violations have deeply eroded the mutual trust between BPD and the community it serves. Trust that is essential to effective policing as well as to officer and public safety. Over the past five years, police have stopped over 300,000 pedestrians in African-American neighborhoods on little or no suspicion of law-breaking, often frisking them, even strip-searching some in public. One man in his mid-50s was stopped 30 times, but never given so much as a ticket. This man says he tried hard to avoid interacting with police. But despite that, you know, had at least a couple dozen instances with law enforcement um, that I'm pretty sure were just predicated on, predicated on the fact that, you know, I'm a young black man. And the report says police too often resort to excessive force, even when there's no danger to officers or others. The mayor, who asked for the civil rights investigation, says it will help lead to reforms. I believe transparency is the only true foundation upon which we can rebuild community trust. City officials say it could cost up to $10 million a year to change the way police are trained, equipped, and supervised, but they say they are willing to make the changes this blistering report calls for. Uh-uh. Get him, come! Get him! Get him! Get him! 
Yo, get that telephone. Roll over, Papa. Let, just roll over. Let him handcuff you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Get that, get that dog off of there. Get that dog off of him. Roll over now. Roll over now. He's knocked out. I got all of this. I got all of this. No, he's knocked out. He's knocked out. He's not even moving. He's not. Get that dog off of him. Back off a little. Roll over, put your head by that now. Do it now. Roll over. Roll over. Roll over. Roll him over. Roll him over. He can't move. He's out. He's knocked out. That's what I want to roll it. That's what I want to roll it. Huh? That's the beat when you get that man. I think that's what I want to roll it. That's what you said. I got it all on camera. Crazy, man. Man, I feel so bad for him, yo, for real. They punched him, stumped him, kicked him, and then they let the dog out of the car and the dog bit him. In his face and, on, and, and around his body. These are the final moments before 32 year old Philip White's death this past Tuesday. A family friend released this video to NBC10 News just a short time ago. It gives a clear picture of how violent police officers handled White as he laid on the ground. Melita Sims says she grew up with White and is shocked by his death. He was a caring person. He always was the type to be there to, you know, to protect you. We asked violent police and Cumberland prosecutors to comment about this new video. No one responded on a day when many offices are closed for Good Friday. But a top-ranking law enforcement official and former use of force instructor who is not connected to the case did comment. I asked a 30-plus year veteran for his observations. Speaking on anonymity, he tells us police appear to have White under control and should have called off the dog immediately. But he says he was most disturbed when he saw one officer do this. You see what happened here? All of it? Mm -hmm. All right, I need your information. I'm going to take your phone. Our law enforcement expert says that demand was inappropriate and police have no right to take anyone's cell phone because they are recording uniformed police officers making an arrest. My professional role in this matter is plain to seek justice on behalf of an innocent 25-year-old man who was unreasonably taken into custody after fleeing in his neighborhood, which just happens to be a high-crime neighborhood and had his spine partially severed in the back of a Baltimore police wagon. For those that believe that I'm anti-police, it's simply not the case. I'm anti-police brutality. And I need not... I need not remind you that the only loss and the greatest loss in all of this was that of Freddie Gray's life. We do not believe that Freddie Gray killed himself. We, we stand by the medical examiner's determination that Freddie Gray's death was a homicide. However, after much thought and prayer, it has become clear to me that without being able to work with an independent investigatory agency from the very start, without having a say in the election of whether our cases proceed in front of a judge or a jury, without communal oversight of policing in this community, without real substantive reforms to the current criminal justice system, we could try this case a hundred times in cases just like it, and we would still end up with the same result. Accordingly, I have decided not to proceed on the cases against Officer Garrett, Sergeant Alicia White, or to relitigate re the case against William Porter. What I've learned through this experience is that every battle, every hurdle, every obstacle that we've overcome since the pursuit of these cases has brought us one step closer to equality, and that any and every step towards equality in our justice system is well worth fighting for. This system. This system is in need of reform, and when it comes when it comes to police accountability, and as long as I'm the chief prosecutor for this city, I vow to you that my office and I will fight. We will fight for a fair and equitable justice system for all, so that whatever happened to Freddie Gray never happens to another person in this community again. Thank you. All right, and we back on 
the forecast. So, yet another brother in D.C., a brother by the name of Terrence Sterling, was shot and killed by the police. And yet again, the police are not charged with murdering this man. And the sad thing is, in America, you would never run out of these stories. So, let's see what happened with my brother Terrence Sterling up in D.C., Let me get the TCC. I don't know where my. To the side. To the side. Yeah. Keep looking at me, buddy. Keep looking at me. Keep looking at me. Keep looking at me, buddy. Keep looking at me, all right? Just keep looking at me. 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 Keep looking at me, buddy. Keep looking at me. Look at me. Open them up. There you go. Come on, man. Open them up. Open them up. Come on, buddy. Open right, your eyes. Come on, buddy. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Now, this third and third Keep looking at me. Keep looking at me. Keep looking at me. There you go. Open them up. Open them up, bud. There you go. Keep them up. Keep them open. Keep them open, buddy. Is this third and him or third and you? Which one? Keep them open. Keep them open. In the side. In the chest. I'm in New York. Stop New York and him. What did you do? Street, Northwest. Third. Keep open them up. Open them up. Keep open. Stop. Two. 
300 is aware. Those guys are probably 30 in the area. Keep them open, keep them open. Okay, Let's have all transmission yeah, good ahead. for a supervisor. Yeah. He was yep. copy the message. We'll take it here. Come on. Uh, CIC, can I get 300 for time? Keep them open, keep them open. You're with me. Look, 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 look. Yeah. So by the time this police officer even starts rolling the camera, my brother is already laid out on the ground bleeding. And the police always have the same old story that they just expect us to believe, despite video evidence not being on their side, despite DNA not being on their side, despite witnesses, in this particular case, witnesses right there saying he didn't do anything that was right there when it happened. Despite all of those things, we're supposed to just take the police word for it, even though they never show proof for anything that they say. They have the evidence we're not going to show you, but take our word for it. And we're supposed to just do that. Now, let's hear why they decided not to press charges on this particular police officer. No charges for the D.C. police officer who shot and killed Terrence Sterling last year. That officer's name is Brian Trainer. The U.S. attorney decided not to move forward with a criminal case against him. Sterling was shot to death by Officer Trainer after Sterling's motorcycle collided with Trainer's police car. Sterling was not armed. In a statement just into our newsroom, the U.S. attorney's office writes, federal prosecutors have found insufficient evidence to charge the officer. The statement says the evidence reviewed by the U.S. attorney backs up the police department's story that Officer Trainer was trying to get out of the police cruiser when Sterling rammed the door of it and the officer shot Sterling twice. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, she's going to be here live with us on set for Off Script tonight at 7 o'clock. She issued a statement this evening. She writes, while the District of Columbia government has no control over the federal prosecutor's decision in this case, we do control our agency's policies and procedures. As the department commences its disciplinary review, MPD has asked for the officer's resignation. She goes on to repeat the trainer and his partner broke police policy by not turning on their body cameras until one to three minutes after the shots were fired. So yet again, here we have another officer breaking the rules, not even having his body camera on until after the fact. But, the, you know, this attorney doesn't find enough reason to go for it with any charges because of, quote unquote, insufficient evidence. Now, we can just look at the fact of how they treat these black judges and black attorneys for not having all white juries or not wanting the death penalty. But they don't say a word to these attorneys who decide not to press charges on these police officers. They don't want to boycott them. They don't take their power away, but they do take away the power of judges who say no all-white juries. That in itself should wake us up to how America really feels, in at least the court system anyway. Now, the police say that this man was bumping into their car and driving crazy, going over 100 miles an hour. But, you know, they would have dash cam footage of that, which they have not released or shown or anything like that. So, you know, I would like to see that because they would damn sure put it out if they had it. But even so, that doesn't warrant killing this man. And he had no gun. He was unarmed. They letting cops kill us in road rage accidents. Should they even want to prosecute the man that shot Joe McKnight? That man, Ronald Gasser. He was not no police officer. He was just a regular dude involved in a road rage accident. So after this man does all of this stuff, which 
they have no video evidence of or haven't shown any video evidence of him doing. They shoot him and then try to do CPR on him after he's already dead. And even though the city representatives obviously think he did something wrong because he should lose his job, this prosecutor says there is insufficient evidence in this case. And while we're playing by their rules, it doesn't really matter what we do. You know, the attorney can say, we're not going to press charges. And even if the attorney does press charges, we live in a country where a black judge got suspended for not letting a black defendant have an all-white jury. We have to worry about the jury selection in these cases. And then when we do get the attorneys who give us the fair juries, we have to worry about the cop saying, well, I just want a bench trial, and the judge just lets them off. At the end of the day, we have to attack the problem from its roots. We cannot keep taking casualties. We cannot let them just murder us and get away with it, or murder us at all. It's a lot more difficult to go into a crowd of people who are armed and violate somebody's rights than it is just to go into a crowd of people who won't do anything to you. The Black Panthers, all they talked about was defending yourself and telling people about the Second Amendment right, and they call them as bad as the KKK. But the KKK is still around today. The Black Panthers are not. We will not get justice until we create justice, until we build a nation for ourselves, at least control our local areas first, and then build on that and connect each local area until we connect as American black people and then connect with other areas in the world of black people and build a nation together. Otherwise, our homes will be extorted. Our natural resources will be extorted. Us as a people will be extorted until we get on the same page. In America, it was literally harder for a slave catcher to kill a runaway slave than it is for a cop to kill a black man today. Back then, slaves were seen as white men's property. And those white men would get compensated if you harmed or killed their property. Today, a cop could kill one of us and charges may not even be brought up. He's definitely not going to jail. Of course, America doesn't want to see black people empower themselves because America's success and many countries' success around the world depends on your failure. Their power depends on your lack of power. But our ancestors just here in America showed us the areas where we could be successful if we just had unity, if we just worked together. It's okay if we have different beliefs. That's how we get different things done. Everybody has their own area of expertise. And all we have to do is just work together and support each other to be able to bring that out. We can create our own schools. We can educate our own children. We can build our own economy. And once we get rid of this tribalism mindset, there will be nothing stopping us from doing just that. That's why they keep you in the tribalism mindset. It's all about divide and conquer. It's a simple technique, but it's very effective. But we're reminded of the same thing every single day. And if us protecting our children isn't enough to make us put aside this tribalism mindset and come together, then, you know, we have a long way to go. They just shot this dude. Our special investigation unit got to work, and now police are talking. Our coverage of the shooting of Terrence Sterling has gotten the attention of the top brass in the D.C. Police Department. Last night, we took a closer look at the possible reasons why D.C. Officer Brian Trainer 
failed to turn his body camera on before he shot and killed Sterling, who was unarmed. Tonight, Delia Gonsalves sits down with the police commander who rolled out the body cam program to talk about the problem and what they're doing to fix it. The video lasts five minutes, but it still doesn't explain why 31-year-old Terrence Sterling lay dying on the streets of D.C., shot twice by Officer Brian Trainer, 27 years old, four years on the force, a body cam attached to his chest, but he failed to turn it on until after the shooting, a violation of D.C. police policy. It's split-second decisions. So did the officer's training fail him? Commander Ralph Ellis rolled out the program. It's ongoing training and strict policy that requires an officer to turn on his body cam before arriving to a scene. But when an officer does not follow the protocol and then finds himself in high stress and what he perceives to be a life-threatening situation, it's reasonable, the commander says, that they don't turn on the camera right away. The commander tells us officers are trained to stop the threat, keep people safe. On that early September morning, there was a call for an erratic driver on a motorcycle. The officers caught up with Sterling about a mile away, cut him off at the intersection. The bike struck the passenger side door of that cruiser. Officer Trainer fired his gun. Terrence Sterling was unarmed. Do you feel like the public feels as if the officer may be hiding something because there's no video? I think, and I, and I can tell you from attending community meetings and various levels all over the city for the past 10 years that overwhelmingly the public in Washington DC trusts the police department here. There's a segment of society no matter where you go that's going to be uh, distrustful for many reasons. You know, it, it's the gamut and you know you have to be cognizant of that and, and open so that you can show that segment of the public that we are sincere and here to help them. And there's an expectation that when you have a uh, case that there's going to be video available and it does put us in a little bit of a bind sometimes in court where we have to explain the various reasons why it's not. But new technology could help. A sensor attached to a gun's holster means the second an officer draws his or her weapon, the body cam is activated and a Bluetooth signal turns on cameras around it. The department is now looking into these sensors that hit the market at the end of the year. Stop, 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 stop. Stop right here! Stop right here! at the doorway and you said, my priority is my wife and my daughter. Right. Their sanctity and their being able to stay sane because of what had happened and the strain and the stress that we were under as a family. And we needed time. Has some of that lifted? Some of that has lifted. Not all the way, probably never be the same uh, again in the, in the rest of our lives because a part of us is missing. I said, I want to do it, but my son was a viable part of this, this family. He stayed in this house with us. I saw him every day, morning and evening. We want to be able to, to move forward and move on, but we can't because we're stuck here and want to know what actually happened with him. And what are the authorities doing in terms of, because we're not getting any feedback as to what they're doing. I mean, there's been 
uh, investigation, grand jury. I mean, but we still don't have any answers to what happened with our son. We've been trying to be patient and, and asking God to give us patience and people are rallying around us and helping us to get through this situation. But you, you know, your, your, your patients have a point too where they, they come to an end and you wanna know what's going on. She says, this your son and, and we said, yeah. And she said, well, he, did, he, he did make it. One of the hardest things I ever did in my life was to sit down and have to plan a funeral for a son that was 31 years old. We sat down as a family, had a dinner a week before my son died. Having a good time, laughing and talking, and talking about how things were going for us and what we are gonna do, what they, as my daughter and my son were gonna do in their future lives and being able to laugh and rally around each other and have a good time. The next week he was gone and we still don't have any answers as to what really happened with him. This is not like me against the police department or anybody else. It's just about knowing what happened and getting justice for my son. All right, and we back on the forecast. And, you know, I want to say RP to the brother Freddie Gray and to the brother Terrence Sterling. And that list just keeps growing and growing. And no one is being held accountable for it because we are not holding them accountable for it. Of course, they're not going to hold themselves accountable for what they do. We have to hold them accountable for it. You cannot ask somebody for your power. You cannot beg them for some power. Because at the end of the day, they can always just take that power away from you. So, as always, man, we have got to start standing for something. Or we're going to keep falling for anything.